Okay, so uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming uh, on this wretched day uh, to hear what I hope will be an enlightening lecture, uh, lecture of opportunity by Daniel Jurgen on the future of energy geopolitics. Uh, Daniel Jurgen is a Pulitzer Prize winner. You know, he's created one of the world's foremost energy consultancies, uh, and he's the author of, uh, uh, most recently, of uh, the new map. Uh, energy, climate, and the class of nations. I'm going to spare uh, talking about any of the other accolades he's won and, and relate to you a very personal anecdote about Dr. Jurgen. So this is the first time that I actually met Daniel Jurgen, uh, despite the fact that I've been working on the oil industry for over 15 years. And so when I first came to Georgetown back in 2006, my advisor, who's also here, David Painter, had been teaching for over 20 years. Uh, and although he had supervised numerous PhD students, as far as I can tell, none of them had actually decided to write about the history of the oil industry, despite the fact that David Painter was one of the foremost experts on oil and U.S. foreign policy. And I came to Georgetown expecting to write something else, uh, completely unrelated. And Dr. Painter spent the first semester just sort of giving me the very sort of soft sell that you should you should consider writing about the oil industry, but I was reluctant to devote my life to, to studying this. And finally, just before the winter break, he told me, here, I want you to read a book. It's called The Prize by Daniel Jurgen. Read it over the break uh, and let me know what you think. And now the funny thing is, I knew who Daniel Jurgen was, but nothing to do with oil. Because when I was a senior at Cornell as a history undergrad, during my Cold War history class, a professor talked about something called the Yalta and the Riga axioms, these different ways in which American foreign policymakers looked at the Soviet Union. And the Yalta and the Riga axioms was this concept that Dr. Jurgen sort of pioneered in his first book, which, is, which, which I've read and I, and, and I love and I commend to all of you. It's called um, uh, Shattered Peace. And it's about the formation of the, the American national security state and the origins of the Cold War after... Uh, after World War II. And that was how I knew Daniel Jurgen. I knew nothing about Daniel Jurgen as the oil historian. And so I decided to humor Dr. Painter and I decided to read the prize over the break. And all I'm going to say is when I came back in January, I was hooked. I, 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 I decided that this was what I was going to devote myself uh, to studying. And it's what I have done in some way or another for the last 15 years. And so even though Dr. Painter made me the scholar that I am, Dr. Jurgen inspired me to be the sort of scholar that I am today. And without his influence, uh, I would never have chosen this path. And so I'm grateful to him for his inspiration. And I, I invited him here precisely because he is such an inspirational, insightful figure. And I hope you will gain as much from uh, hearing his words as I gained from reading his book many years ago. So Dr. Jurgen, over to you. Thank you very much, Anand, for those uh, very gracious words. It's a heavy responsibility you put on me that uh, I had something to do with your career path, but clearly it's worked out very well. So uh, I appreciate uh, the invitation uh, to be here and finally to be able to meet you in person and to join the others, uh, your colleagues, and of course the students, and also of course to welcome uh, Professor Painter from Georgetown as well. So uh, I'm really glad to, not only to be, even though it's virtual, back at the, the Naval War College, but to be back there because I spoke in 2014 at the International Sea Power Symposium. And uh, it was a different time. Uh, it was much more an era of globalization. Uh, my focus was about where globalization had come from, where it was going, uh, and the crucial role that the US Navy plays in basically underwriting, guaranteeing how the world economy works. And, um, you know, and it's a much more interconnected world than people think. One of the chapters I have in the, in the new map is about a man named Malcolm McLean who invented containerization, basically because he was trying to figure out how to get his, uh, his, uh, his trucks from uh, New York to Texas faster. Uh, and of course, the significance of that without containerization, China would not play the role in the world economy that it does today. But uh, times change. Uh, we have a risk of fragmentation of globalization. Uh, Deng Xiaoping famously said, has an ironic tone today, that 
Hong Kong would be one country, two systems. Uh, the question is, are we now heading for one world, two systems? And uh, Anand talked about my first book, which was on the origins of the Cold War. And I have to say that I never expected to be writing another book about what might be origins of uh, a new Cold War. But in a way, as I was writing the new map, that's what I felt I was doing. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, I, that's the way it seems uh, to me. Uh, it was very significant that I was there in 2014. I wrote a piece that some of you may have seen called The Four Ghosts Who Haunt the South China Sea. And it's very much inspired by being there, be, by being in that house that uh, uh, Mahan, Mahan built, uh, by uh, seeing uh, Admiral Wu Shengli, who was the head of the Chinese Navy at the time there, and just kind of uh, having the sense of uh, uh, how the past uh, haunts the present and the future. Now, let me turn to the new map, which brings these themes together. Uh, I had the idea of starting the new map with a little write-up about the oldest map in the world, about 4,300 years old, that was found near Kirkuk in, uh, in northeast Iraq in about 1930, and about how maps tell stories, however they're done. But my publisher said, no, no, you can't do that. Just get to the start of your story. And the start of the new map is about how uh, we have a new map of energy and geopolitics. And that's what I try to, uh, to tell and, it, it, and to bring it together. And it is the sense that the, um, the terrain has just shifted so much. Uh, the shale revolution in terms of oil, transforming the position of the United States, raising questions about the US engagement, nature of US engagement in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf. Uh, there's a solar revolution in lower cost and wind. Uh, the Paris conference that was held in 2015 uh, that has been decisive. And one result of it was last week's announcement by General Motors, no more gasoline powered cars after 2035, they're saying. Uh, the world's changed dramatically in terms of US-Russian relations. Uh, I think just today, uh, Medvedev, the former Russian president said, talked about insulating themselves from the global internet. And of course, the big issue, which many of you are engaged in, is the US-China relations having changed so dramatically. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little later about two specific things, the geopolitical consequences of the shale revolution and this question of a new Cold War with China uh, and whether it's there and, and how it's unfolding. Um, the idea from the book emerged looking at maps, uh, literal maps, seeing how trade routes were changing, uh, pipelines were changing, how relations uh, were, were all of that. But it really became metaphorical for me because maps is concepts of a way of organizing the world. So the book is divided into six maps. America's map, is a story of how the US went from importing 60% of its oil uh, to being self-sufficient uh, and uh, whether we're gonna maintain that position. Russia's map is about this um, story about how, uh, how Russia, which is a country whose GDP is slightly smaller than Italy, somewhat larger than Spain. Under Putin, he's made Russia a great power it's a superpower in terms of energy and in terms of nuclear weapons and geographically, economically though, it's far from that. But um, energy figures in so much of the current discord uh, as do maps, the unsettled questions about the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union, uh, which I think has really been at the heart of the growing tension, particularly focused on the relationship between Russia and Ukraine. China's map is really about two maps. One is the map of the South China Sea, which we'll come back to, uh, and uh, what that means in China's relationship with the United States. And the other is in the Belt and Road, which was really, it was an interesting map literally to put together because it's really a whole, it's a, it's a map with a lot of vectors, but it's basically China's drive to reshape the global economy and put the Middle Kingdom at the center of it uh, with this uh, phrase connectivity and involves energy and uh, a lot of other things as well. Uh, very significant and something the US has been trying to uh, counter, but uh, it was very powerful because China was willing to give money without many strings. It just wanted uh, the debt uh, that would 
uh, give them ultimate control. A uh, question about China, and I'm sure in the courses that you have, you've been talking about it, uh, the Thucydides trap, which Professor Allison at uh, Harvard came up with, which is really what, what happens when you have a, a hegemonic or a, a major power and a rising power, and how do they adjust to uh, the world? And it goes back, of course, to the war between Athens and Sparta. And I think it is actually a useful construction for thinking uh, in a larger historical perspective about the US and China today. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about the South China Sea. But as I said, uh, the question is, are we moving towards a, a new Cold War? Uh, you see it, um, there is a Cold War in terms of trade. There is a war going on in terms of technology for sure. Uh, not in energy uh, yet by any means. In fact, that was an area where it was thought there would be an inevitable zero-sum game between China, but it didn't turn out that way. Um, and of course, uh, in the posture of militaries, as you, some of you know, the doctrines of US uh, branches of US military are changing, and certainly the Chinese are very focused on one thing, which is US power. I have a, a section called the Maps of the Middle East. And uh, I came across on the internet once an ISIS militant stomping his feet on this, what he said was the sand on the border between Iraq and Syria saying, sykes Picot is dead, sykes Picot is dead. By that he meant the map that was drawn at the 2015 and, uh, 1915 and 1916, which was meant to be uh, create what the map of the Middle East would look like when there was no longer an Ottoman Empire. And it's really the origin of the uh, state system. And overturning that system has been one of the kind of major dramas. Go back to Gamal Abdel Nasser, that's what he was trying to do. Uh, Iran has been consistently trying to do it. ISIS and Al Qaeda are trying to do it. Uh, and um, it uh, obviously, the US has, as you all know, a very big role there. And I, uh, Dex Wilson just told me, just finished his class uh, seminar today on the, uh, the first Gulf War. And it was after the first Gulf War in 1995 that the Fifth Fleet was reactivated and put in Bahrain exactly because of the importance of the security of uh, that region. And um, is, you know, there, as it, the picture changes, there'll be question about the nature of our commitment. Uh, there are new maps in the region uh, one is the Eastern Med, which uh, was a dead sea as far as energy, but has now turned out to be a very big source of natural gas. It's brought Egypt and Israel closer together, uh, as well as uh, Cyprus and Greece. But it's also become a new frontier for hostility between uh, uh, Turkey and the other countries in the region. And if you're looking at where there could be difficulties in the future, uh, certainly Turkey's, uh, the way Turkey's moving signals that with Erdogan claiming almost, uh, the president of uh, Turkey claiming almost uh, an Ottoman vocation. Um, diversification is a very important question for the countries in that region. Uh, Vision 2030 is the Saudi version of that. Um, and um, it's not easy to diversify an economy that's heavily dependent upon oil. And it turns out you actually need a lot of oil revenues uh, to do that. Um, and I think the countries in the region are asking, what does it mean for the engagement of the US in the region over time if the US is energy independent, which the United States has now become? And one of, I think an example of the new map was the deal uh, that was made in uh, really the treaty between the UAE and Israel. A much bigger deal, I think, than maybe was recognized in the United States at that time, because we had a lot else going on, including a presidential election. Uh, but obviously it's about uh, Iran. Uh, it's about um, economic relations. Uh, it's about stability in the region. I think it's also about questions about where, what is the US role gonna be in the future? in that region, and in a sense, a, a hedge to uh, uh, bring together two very strong uh, militaries in that region 
uh, in a more explicit cooperation than in the past. And I think a greater concern about the risk and danger from drones and the ability that Israel has established to, uh, to deal with that. Uh, two other big maps in the book or sections. One is a roadmap of the future. And in it, I have a conversation that uh, the CEO of uh, uh, General Motors said about 15 years ago saying, you know, most businesses, their business models don't last for a century and that for the automobile industry had lasted for a century. And would it change? Well, now we're really seeing a change. Um, you know, it was in 2008 that Tesla brought out its um, Roadster and it was kind of a novelty. 12 years later, look what's happening. General Motors has said no more uh, gasoline powered cars after 2035. So you have a combination of a shift to electric vehicles a shift to self-driving cars, which by the way, owes its origin to DARPA, uh, the Defense uh, Advanced Research uh, Agency, which financed uh, the, develop the, the, the competitions for self-driving vehicles and ride hailing. And maybe we might be looking at a very different kind of automobile industry with different uh, energy implications. About 40 to 45% of the oil in the United States is used for gasoline. But I'll say it will be a long time before our automobile fleet really changes. The average car in the United States stays on the road at least 12 years. The final section, and I know we'll talk about it later, is climate map. And there, I think, is really two eras, the era before the Paris Climate Agreement and after the Paris Climate Agreement. And now um, uh, the objectives, which have become net zero carbon by 2050 have been really adopted around the world, including by the Biden administration. And you can't go anywhere in the energy world today without running in, colliding with the phrase energy transition. Everybody talks about it. Not very clear really what it means and how it will play out. I would just say energy transitions have been going on for a long time. Putting on an economic historian hat, I say it began in 1709 when an English metal worker figured out you can make iron better or with using coal rather than wood. And, uh, but these took a long time. Oil was discovered in Pennsylvania in 1859. It wasn't until the 1960s that oil overtook coal as the world's number one energy resource. Wind and solar, uh, they're very competitive now, but they're 50 year old industries that took 40 years to become uh, competitive. Um, Further shift, of course, that uh, President Biden has said that uh, climate is a national security issue. And the big question for everybody is what will the energy mix look like? Uh, how much oil and gas and how much renewables? And the view I take in the new map, it's gonna be a mix for quite a long time. And even in 2050, you don't see how the world works without uh, oil and natural gas as part of the mix. So what I wanna do now is focus in on two topics that I think are highly relevant for you all. One is the shale revolution in the United States. This was basically the result of one person being obsessed. It's amazing that one person can have that impact, but look at Tesla, it was one person being obsessed, uh, Elon Musk. Uh, there was a man named George P. Mitchell who in the early 1980s, 80, 1982 actually, became convinced that you could get oil and gas from this very dense rock called shale. The petroleum engineering textbook said, not possible, it doesn't work. He controlled his company, they spent 16 years, they were about to give up, and then these are the, how the accidents of history work, and I think like, people like Anand and I like history, partly because of the accidents. Some petroleum engineer goes to a baseball game in Dallas and sits with somebody who says, well, try this technology we're using. So this is the last well, they're gonna try it, they try it, it works. So shale goes from the US being the world's largest importer of oil in the world, 60% uh, of our consumption in 2008, to now being an exporter of oil. And natural gas, we were gonna be importing vast amounts of LNG. Now we're one of, gonna be one of the world's three biggest exporters of LNG. A lot of economic impacts from this, millions of jobs. It's been a big deal for the manufacturing industries in the Midwest. It's been responsible for over $200 billion of investment in new factories. And if you go back to 2008, the US was spending almost $400 billion a year importing oil. Now we're not spending any money basically importing oil. So when we talk about all these stimulus bills, 
400 billion dollars is a pretty significant stimulus to have that money in the US economy. It's important, for instance, the state of uh, New Mexico, its revenues, one third of its budget come from oil and gas. And the two things that I think really concern you all is what does it mean for energy security? And what does it mean for foreign policy? For energy security, there is a facility in Saudi Arabia called Abcake. It processes about 10% or can process about 10% of all the oil that's in world trade every day. It's the single most important piece of hardware probably in the world oil industry. In September of 2019, drones, allegedly first from uh, the Houthis in Yemen, but clearly Iranian, uh, rained down on Abcake and on another facility called Colrais. If that had happened seven or eight years ago, there would have been panic in the world oil market. I looked the other day at the daily prices. It hardly had any impact. Why? Because of the shale revolution, the United States had transformed the oil market and the thinking about the oil market and a sense of security that just was not there before. What does it mean for foreign policy? It's meant flexibility for the US in foreign policy. Whether you're with Obama's approach to Iran, Trump's approach, or what will be Biden's approach, none of that would have worked if we were still importing a lot of oil. The Iranians said, you'll never get us to negotiate over nuclear, our nuclear program by cutting off our oil because the world can't do without our oil. It turned out it could because US oil was there to fill the void. In the book, I describe a, a scene when I was at a conference, which is uh, Putin's version of the Davos conference uh, called the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. And on the stage was Putin and Chancellor Merkel. And you could see the iciness between the two of them. They told me that I should ask the first question. And so I was gonna ask the perennial question, uh, President Putin, how are you planning to diversify your economy and be so less reliant on oil and gas? By accident, I mentioned the word shale, and he started shouting at me. And being shouted at in front of 3,000 people by Vladimir Putin is not a happy experience. Uh, and he went on, as I thought about it afterwards, I realized the two reasons he doesn't like shale is one, it makes the US competitive with him for gas markets in Europe. And he sees shale as an adjunct to US foreign policy, strengthening US foreign policy. I have seen that, I work closely at, I'm on the uh, Energy Advisory Committee for the Government of India. And I can see that the fact that we're exporting significant energy to India has become a cornerstone of that relationship. Obviously, there are other cornerstones as well, the Indo-Pacific security, but this has become a very concrete thing. And I can see with South Korea, with Japan, that they're importing energy from us adds to their energy security and is another way tying us together. And I'll tell you, China would be really jealous or is really jealous of our position. China imports 75% of its oil and it regards that as a strategic weakness. Uh, and, uh, and I'll come back to that in terms of the South China Sea. So there is you know, the question now, what does the new Biden administration do on energy? And they've taken some steps to at least somewhat restrict uh, development of US oil and gas. But I think just to keep in mind, and I'd like to remind people that if you restrict uh, or indeed ban fracking as some of the people in the Democratic primary said they wanted to do, what that really is is an import more oil policy. That's what, that's what will happen because there are 280 million cars on the US roads that run on oil or in gasoline and they're not gonna stay in the garage. But this question of China then helps us pivot to the nine dash line. Uh, I think, and I think I will get into discussion and I'll be very interested to hear what you all think, but I, I would argue that it's not only, it's the most important body of water in the world today for uh, the world economy, uh, because one third of world trade passes through it. Uh, I would also argue, and again, would be interested to hear what you all think, that it's also the most dangerous uh, body of water in the world right now. So, um, the new map is a book about the past, the present, and the future. So in terms of the past, I got really curious, how did the South China Sea become this issue where US and Chinese naval vessels come very close and uh, dangers of collisions? And uh, going back in the archives, I found that uh, when uh, Captain George Miesermaker, 
a French captain, set sail from Saigon in 1933, when it was uh, Southeast Asia was French Indochina. And he had quite an armada. He had one gunboat, one fishing trawler, and one hydrographic boat. And they sailed to nine islands, weather allowing, in the South China Sea. And at each one, they read a proclamation of sovereignty, inserted into a bottle, and then put it into a boundary market and claimed those islands as French territory. And uh, by the way, Vietnam would later say it's, they're Vietnamese as a result of that. This created, when news finally traveled, no internet of course, to Beijing outrage and much discussion. But the Chinese military council said, we need to cool down the game with the French. Our Navy is weak and these nine islands are not useful to us for now. Well, the geographers did not agree. They were very nationalistic. And there was a geographer named Pei Mei Chu. I have his picture in the book. Uh, uh, who was at the forefront of, uh, of uh, this nationalistic geography. And already in 1930, he had produced a national humiliation map to help the Chinese people to be patriotic. And this theme of the century of humiliation is central to Chinese policy today, absolutely central to their narrative. So in 1936, three years after uh, Captain Miesmeicher's voyage, uh, Bei Meichu drew a map that showed most of the South China Sea belonging to China. That is the nine dash line. It was adopted by the communists when they took basis. And it is on that basis that they're turning tiny islands or creating islands and making them into military bases and challenging US naval vessels and US military airplanes. To make sense of it for myself, and I hope for readers, I, I said there are really three contentious questions. Who owns the islands? Uh, and that's contentious. Are the waters of the South China Sea international waters, or are they, as China says, national territory of China? And the extended economic zones, are they only economic, or do they also mean that the country to whom they belong uh, controls those waters, and the US Navy, if it wants to pass through, needs China's permission to go through that? Why are the Chinese so insistent on the South China Sea? Um, you know, maybe some of you will have some enlightenment on that. There is an energy component. There's a lot of notions that there are billions and billions of dollars of reserves under it. My colleagues in IHS market who um, study the geology of the region uh, do not believe that there are large resources there. There are resources that are significant for individual companies, but they're not gonna, they're not gonna move the needle. Uh, and the international companies, I think, agree with us, just that's the nature of the geology. Uh, it is significant because of Taiwan. Uh, if there's an incident involving Taiwan, the Chinese worry that the U.S. Navy would, uh, would block uh, passage of oil through the Strait of Malacca and through the South China Sea. So uh, there is that. There is just deep-seated nationalism. You talk to Chinese they are taught in schools. I've asked Chinese from elementary school that this is Chinese territory. And it goes back to the century of humiliation. I have a scene in the book in which uh, uh, now President Xi, when he became general secretary of the secretary of the Communist Party, the first thing he did was take the Politburo with him over to a museum and stand in front of an exhibit called the century of humiliation and saying, this is over now. We're now in uh, the, pursuing the Chinese group dream. Uh, in, the, in a subsequent article that some of you may have seen, I built upon um, the, uh, this issue, really to just say you know, how serious this is, talked about the four ghosts who, uh, who haunt the South China Sea. And the idea for it, as I say, came from my visit in 2014 to uh, the Naval War College and being there. And there's Admiral uh, Zheng He, who uh, was a great Chinese admiral who sailed as far as Africa. And that is kind of the claim. China's claim to South China Sea is based on history, not international law. I counterpose that to Hugo Grotius, the father of the law of sea. And it's interesting to know that the law of the sea that everybody talks about was a result of a battle between a Dutch ship and a Portuguese ship in the South China Sea uh, about a century after Admiral um, uh, uh, Admiral Zhang Then, of course, is Admiral Mahan, uh, 
uh, whose idea of sea power was totally absorbed by the Chinese. And then I talk about somebody, and I don't know if you talk about it in many of the courses, Norman Angel, who wrote a book about called The Great Illusion. And people always say, God, that guy really made a mistake because he said the World War I couldn't happen because everybody was so economically interconnected. It's not what he said. He said if a war happened, the consequence would be very severe because everybody is so economically interconnected. And of course, that's what happened. And so I think that is, um, all of this is very relevant today. Uh, are we in a new Cold War? If we are, it will be very different from the Soviet American Cold War. That was about nuclear weapons, it was about ideology, but the Soviet Union was a minor factor in the world economy. China and the US are so much more interconnected than people realize in so many different ways economically. Both are so embedded in the world economy uh, that uh, how do you, but, but you, I've, you've seen the language change. Uh, I looked at, what was it, five US presidents from uh, Reagan onward, no, more than five, uh, talked about how engagement with China, constructive relationship, that language is gone now. Now it's about great power rivalry, strategic rivalry, uh, peer competition, and the Chinese are the same way. They talk about um, uh, that we're trying to contain them. And so it does get back to these questions of, of intentions. Uh, so, but it's a more com much more complicated picture. It's not clear to me what the resolution is. Uh, this new administration is going to make an effort to at least stabilize or make more predictable US-Chinese relations. But, there, but this administration is also going to put more emphasis on human rights, uh, which is going to raise questions about both Hong Kong and the Uyghurs. And so, uh, and of course, the South China Sea is the cauldron where the risk of an accident of some kind of event happening when communication just, and the, the other bonds are less tied together. Five or seven years ago, we would have said trade tied the two nations together. Now that's a subject of contention. So uh, I'm very interested to kind of move from this now to the question period, but I hope that there's not only a question period because I'd really like to hear from you all with your perspectives and experience on these questions uh, in the time that we have. Uh, so uh, Anand, I turn it back to you and uh, thank you. Thanks. Talk about these, the new maps today. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, I've asked uh, certain faculty to, who are experts on, on, on different relevant subjects, offer comments or ask questions. And so I thought we'd start with our China experts. And um, the first person uh, who would like to offer a comment would be Peter Dutton, uh, who is a uh, former director of our China Maritime Studies Institute. Uh, Professor Dutton. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Anand. I, I appreciate it. And thank you for the talk, uh, Daniel. It's a pleasure to see you again. I think you spoke at our uh, energy conference uh, 10 or 12 years ago, and uh, I'm glad to, to see you back uh, virtually at the Naval War College. Um, you asked a, a question uh, that I'd like to uh, reflect back to you on, and that is, why is the South China Sea so important uh, to China, given the fact that I, and I agree with you, that the energy resources are are not substantial enough to make a difference other than to, as you, as you point out, to individual companies in some of the Southeast Asian countries. Um, to my mind, it, come, it comes down to, to two things, right? Uh, and I'll come back to the, to the energy. The first is um, the relationship between geography and security. Um, I think uh, historically the Qing Dynasty um, incorporated large land buffer areas um, into the Chinese empire system, right? So Manchuria, Mongolia, Xinjiang, Tibet came really under formal control <clears throat> of China during the Qing dynasty. Uh, and they were able to create a buffer between, um, a continental buffer between China proper and the uh, expanding great powers of the time, Russia and, and, and Britain actually uh, coming up from the South. But they never managed to, uh, to, to do something similar at sea. And I think uh, the Chinese view uh, the ocean space uh, in, in their, what are usually referred to as the near seas, essentially as completing that arc of uh, buffer, uh, buffer zone uh, between, between the, you know, China proper and encroaching great powers. Um, and so I think um, probably the single most important thing for the Chinese is to establish a, a maritime security buffer zone between 
between uh, between continental China and and maritime powers like the United States and others who might um, cause cause trouble for them. The second big issue I think is um, China in the regional hierarchy. Um, China uses the South China Sea disputes, in my view, to uh, to to uh, improve its position in the regional hierarchy uh, politically and 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 otherwise, but uh, to give it status in terms of the local um, to 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 regional status in terms of regional rulemaking and uh, and and the ability to set the agenda for for the region in many different ways, um, recognizing that China's interest in the South China Sea differs from uh, others. Um, and so uh, coming back to the point about resources, um, I think the way that the Chinese use the resources is essentially as a tool to achieve the other two objectives, right? It's the resources are, are, the, uh, are instrumental. It, it, if it, it creates leverage against the Vietnamese. It creates leverage against the, the Filipinos and increasingly now against Malaysia. So, um, so th that would be my, my reflection back to you. Um, and uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts uh, on that. Well, I think, um, I think those are two very good points. I do remember on your regional hierarchy, I remember once being in Singapore when Xi Jinping was coming to town and I was having breakfast with uh, a pretty senior guy from the defense establishment. And he said, well, I've got to leave now. Uh, we have to go see the emperor. And so I think there is, uh, there is a historical, you know, that there's a historical mindset that plays into that. Um, so I think those are both true. And I think, as you're suggesting, that the uh, energy side of it is the transit of energy that's really important to them. And, uh, but that concept of the buffer zone, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And I do have um, a scene in there when there was it's like 2012, an issue with the Chinese, and they said to, uh, one of the other countries, uh, you know, there are big powers and small powers. And it is, and I, I think the only thing I would kind of would add to that is that I, I think nationalism is really, this nationalist spirit is what really ties it, ties, ties the country together. I remember once asking a senior Chinese economist, what does socialism mean for China today? He said, it means whatever is good for China. So I think, I think you make two very important points. And then if we wrap this sort of nationalist, the, the sense of the century of humiliation, which seems to be uh, just, um, just so deeply ingrained in, in, in their narrative today. And uh, the fact that China, as I think did Anand just mention, this is gonna overtake the US in the size of its economy. Um, and maybe one other thing about the relationship, I think Looking back, the financial crisis of 2008 was a turning point because up till then it was the United States economic model telling everybody else how to do things. And then we really messed up. And so I think that is fed into. So I, I take both, I think both your points are very helpful in putting it in that historical suite. Thank you. Good to see well, you. The next person I wanted to ask, another China person, another China scholar, we have plenty of them at the War College is uh, Dex Wilson. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you, you, you mentioned the container um, and the, the fact that oil will be still be a dominant fuel well into the well into the 21st century. What does that bode for the um, infrastructure aspect of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, in particular, uh, the rail and road lines uh, stretching through Central Asia, potentially all the way to Europe, um, you know, in, in, a, in a world of, of oil and the limitations of rail and road traffic, it, it doesn't seem to be a, a, a winner for uh, China, at least economically. Do you and, mean the Belt and Road yes. as a strategy? or The, 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 the continental arm, arms of the Belt and Road. Well, I think maybe that ties in uh, uh, Professor Dutton's comment that in a way that, first of all, I hadn't thought about that way, but it makes those countries more of a buffer zone too. Uh, it, it asserts Chinese influence, particularly over the Central Asian uh, countries. Um, I think there are many motivations for Belt and Road. I think when it started, 
uh, it had to do with uh, the surplus that Chinese manufacturing, they'd overbuilt capacity and they needed markets. But I think it has taken on a much more geopolitical significance now. And they do see it as, uh, as a way of part of their effort to create uh, an alternative to a US dominated international order. Uh, obviously it's run into some pitfalls, the so-called debt trap uh, and uh, kind of resistance to what some seen as Chinese colonization. But, um, uh, but China has the, has the reserves to continue to, to do it. They, they say they, they don't wanna waste money, but, um, and I think it's also a way of uh, being less dependent on the Malacca Strait actually for, for their goods. Uh, will it get to the scale of, uh, the, of container ships? Uh, probably not, but it will certainly provide an alternative. And it's a way of extending their influence uh, right into uh, Central Europe. All right, uh, the, the next China scholar is my fellow Cornellian, Dr. Isaac Carden. Is he here? He did send me a question. Uh, I'll look up the question. Uh, in the meantime, uh, is Dr. Becca Pincus here? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Laura, can you unmute uh, Isaac Carden, please? Yes, sure. sir. I'm going to um, make I've got uh, it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, thanks for, for a stimulating talk. I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit on the China-Russia energy relationship uh, and particularly on sort of the interaction between the, the economics of it and the geopolitics. Obviously, China, as a huge net importer, likes prices low, likes approximate neighbor with huge energy resources, whereas uh, Russia uh, strongly prefers prices high and probably wants to find ways to use this to leverage China. How, how do you understand that dynamic? Well, it's looking? interesting. So uh, in the book, I described the scene. The U.S. put its sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. For those who don't know, it's a Russian uh, oil pipeline that runs under the Baltic Sea to Germany. And we've put sanctions that stopped at about three weeks from completing this $11 billion project. Within about two weeks of that, there was a ceremony with Xi Jinping in Beijing. And I think Putin in Sochi and then the guys on the Chinese-Russian border inaugurating this power of Siberia pipeline, which is a huge pipeline. And basically what Russia has been doing is pivoting its energy towards Asia and in particular to China and um, uh, it hasn't been easy for the reason you say. I remember talking to some Russians after they negotiated this huge natural gas deal that became power of Siberia and describing there were like three Russians on one side of the table negotiating, about 25 on the other. And it was the negotiation, I think I quote Putin, went till like three in the morning because they agreeing on price was really tough because the Chinese and the Chinese kind of prevailed because they wanted, you know, Russia needed them. This was after Ukraine. That's right. It was after uh, the Ukraine annexation of Crimea. So Russia really needed to deal with, uh, with China. So I think it has become a much more important relationship that goes beyond. Uh, I think energy is a very important foundation, but it goes beyond it. I remember when I was at a more recent St. Petersburg Economic Forum, uh, you had on the stage uh, Putin and Xi. And Putin said to Xi, you know, I'm sorry, I kept you up till four in the morning, your time talking was so late. And Xi said, no problem. We never have enough time to talk. Those guys have met about 30 or more times and they can talk about energy and they can talk about their common antipathy to a US, what they see as a US dominated international order. So I think it's become very much uh, a personal relationship between the two men. It's become an important geopolitical relationship uh, in the in the new map, I mentioned that the Russians are now apparently willing to sell their advanced weapons to China, which they didn't want to do before because of reverse engineering, but it's now part of the relationship that they'll do. So I think that geopolitical connection between those two, I mean, I think that's become a very important geopolitical fact in the world. And uh, uh, they're, you know, they, they have a lot in common, including uh, liking authoritarian systems. 
All right, uh, next up should be uh, Dr. Pincus, who should be uh, able to unmute herself. Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, slightly going in a different direction, I'm wondering what you think the implications for US-China competition are of China's dominant position in the green energy industries of the future, including solar panels, wind turbines, and also rare earth elements, which are vital components of um, advanced batteries as well as solar uh, panels. Thanks. Well, well, I think you've nailed it with your, with your question that uh, the Chinese very early uh, uh, so made this commitment to what they call new energies. Um, there, as an article in the Times pointed out, but which I talk about in the book, GM's turn towards electric cars is not just because of the Biden administration, it's because of uh, what's happened in China, which is a more important market to them than the United States right now. Uh, so I think the Chinese do have a study. I'm co-heading a study in our NIHS market called New Supply Chains for a Net Zero Carbon Economy. And I think this is a really serious uh, uh, issue. We talk about uh, green jobs. Uh, well, you can create green jobs in China is what we can do. And uh, so, uh, and we say, well, we should have mines in the United States. Well, try and get an environmental permit to build a mine in, in the United States. It'll be pretty difficult. So I think, um, you know, over here were supply chains, which were kind of about efficiency, technology, economics, and over here is geopolitics. And I think your question is exactly on target because I think these two things come together and, uh, we're not going to build a solar uh, panel industry in the United States because we can't compete with them. Uh, when I did my previous book called uh, The Quest, at the beginning, I interviewed this guy who headed what was then the largest solar company in the world. By the time I was finishing the book, he'd gone bankrupt because of Chinese competition. So I think, I think that uh, it's pretty formidable. Let me turn the question around. What do you think? I mean, it sounds like you do research on this. Um, it's... Uh, it's a really interesting topic because I think, you know, you make such a compelling case about the ability of the U.S. to have some more latitude in foreign policy because of our oil and gas production. Um, but, you know, when we think about sort of the next wave of green energy, it's less portable, right? You know, solar and, and wind are in situ um, energy generation types, and it's much more about the technology and less about sort of shipping oil around the world. And so, it's interesting to think about how we could build on our gains um, in oil and gas and, and maybe claw back some of the losses in the industries. And, and there may be some trade solutions perhaps you might um, have run across. I mean, uh, you've got such a, a sweeping view of all these issues, right? It's, it's so interesting to hear your thoughts. Well, I, I think that, um, I think solar is kind of really locked in Chinese manufacturing right now. And I've never really found a good answer to how much is it just that they're really good at building big, efficient factories and how much is it that there's subsidies that we don't understand. Um, on um, wind, I think much less dependence. Obviously, rare metals and things are important. Um, but um, wind machines are, can be built in Colorado. So it's, it's uh, we, but you do need certain components and, and inputs, including rare earths and so forth. And the same for, uh, for EVs and electric cars. And I think the Chinese want to dominate electric cars because that's the way they can dominate the world oil uh, automobile market. So I think we're going to see this much more addressed now um, over the next four years than it has been. But there's a, there's a, a reality there that's a little different than some of the, the, the rhetoric there. And I'll just say, even like wind towers need plastics. And here's something that may surprise people. 20% of uh, an electric car is plastic. And uh, by the way, so you've got to get the plastic for somewhere. So uh, how these things flow together is more complicated than people recognize. So, uh, so I think that's going to be a topic of discussion as, as money gets poured into that sector. All right. Uh, Dr. Pincus did us a real favor by uh, allowing us to seamlessly transition to other parts of your book and other areas of expertise among our faculty. Um, and obviously that has to do with 
energy transitions and um, and the role of climate uh, in shaping future geopolitics. So I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Andrea Cameron, who's head of our college's uh, climate security and human security group to, uh, to ask a question and offer a comment. Thank you, Anand. I would like to ask about Russia in particular. So Russia is a signatory to the Paris Climate Accord, but many scholars perceive that you know, the Russian energy market will kind of uh, be counter or actually act counter to climate change goals. And I was just wondering what your assessment was about Russia and the energy transition. I think that um, oil and gas constitute about, for these when prices are back to normal, about half the Russian budget. And uh, that economy, going back to my exchange with Vladimir Putin, such as it was, uh, has no real shine, sense of diversifying. I think they have appointed a climate envoy to uh, go head to head with uh, John Kerry. Uh, but I think uh, they would like to see, they would be very happy to see the US for climate reasons pulling back from oil production because they'd like to fill the market. So don't see them hastening to make the same kind of transition. Uh, I think everybody though in the global energy industry is sort of grappling with what does energy transition mean and how does it unfold and how quickly. Uh, it's interesting if you look at the numbers too, where I mean, people would be really surprised because we all go to the gasoline station and fill up our cars. So, but cars and SUVs probably account for only about 8% of CO2 emissions, uh, which is a much smaller number than people, people would think, oh, it's 50%. And so there are a lot of other areas like agriculture and, of course, the power sector, and coal generation uh, that are there. But I don't see Russia having any, you know, it's more lip service at this point, I think. Thank you. Will that be all, Andrea, or do you have anything more to say? I'll give someone else a chance, and then if I have another one, I'll, I'll take the opportunity. All right, uh, sticking on uh, the sort of big picture about transitions and, uh, and the future of energy, uh, I think here's a, good time, here's a good moment to ask Dr. Painter to weigh in with, uh, with his question. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, Shattered Peace. Um, as uh, Dr. Jurgen mentioned, I just retired and I was cleaning out my office and I found 25 handwritten pages of notes on Shattered Peace. Uh, I used to take a lot of notes. A historic document. I said, well, I'm going to preserve it, <laughs> get a new scanner and, and preserve that. Um, and then uh, also remember uh, the transition from Shattered Peace to uh, Energy Future, uh, where you got started in the energy thing. And one of the things that stood out to me with Energy Future, possibly because at the time I was working in the world in uh, conservation and solar division of the Department of Energy, is that the importance of looking at the demand side as well as the supply side. And, and you know, the supply side is so much more interesting uh, in, in many ways about it's more in geopolitics. Uh, but the demand side, uh, I think Amory Lovins used to talk a lot about the most important source of energy is in your attic, uh, you know, putting in, uh, in other words, conservation. And what, what do you think, is there still a good potential, um, especially in the United States, uh, for conservation as uh, energy policy that will also enhance uh, U.S. geopolitical power because we're not using as much. Uh, and in regard to conservation, let me just throw one other extra thing in to make it more complicated. How do you achieve that? Uh, and teach courses on oil and world power. I've always run into Jevons' paradox that uh, you drive the prices down and people, you know, efficiency can lead to actually greater consumption because prices go down and people use more. Well, thank you, uh, David. And of course, glad you're on and uh, great respect for your work from which I benefited. Um, so uh, I actually got into this whole field because of conservation, just thinking, well, why can't we just be more efficient? And the truth is, we actually have become a lot more efficient uh, at, uh, you know, probably use half as much energy per unit of GDP as we did in the past, but our GDP has grown, but our cars get more efficient. So maybe people drive more 
Uh, but I think we have a whole set of tools in terms of, uh, of uh, information c controls that we didn't have before that enable us to continue to be more efficient. And it is, you say, it is too bad that people kind of, I think the thing is, it's hard to have a visual image of conservation. You can sort of see graceful wind towers, you can see sparkling solar panels, but tell me what conservation looks like, what efficiency looks like, but it's there and you just achieve it uh, incrementally and you achieve it with information control, uh, advanced uh, information technology that you can do things in the past. So I think that probably that is, you don't hear much about that even in the Biden program, mm -hmm. but actually it'd be pretty darn significant uh, going forward. Yeah, I mean, if you look at per capita consumption, the U.S. is still uh, consumes a lot. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, on a per capita basis, especially uh, though, so does uh, Canada and Australia. Yeah. So, I mean, right. And then what I do say in terms of energy transition, working with the Indians, I see a different. They see energy transition very differently. They say we have hundreds of millions of people who are getting sick, cooking with, with wood and waste products. And we want to get them commercial energy. So they, for them, energy transition is not only a big commitment to wind and solar, it's also a big commitment to natural gas, uh, building a natural gas infrastructure and importing natural gas from the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the, the, besides, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously teaching, I've, uh, I've cycled through the prize, the quest, and as soon as it's in paperback, uh, the new map, <laughs> um, what do you think of, of, of Paul Stevens' work? Uh, I, I noticed the uh, Economist had this special issue on industry back in September, just as your book came out. And it looked to me like their whole article was based on his work. He's got this piece on the geopolitics of future oil demand, saying as oil demand goes down, that's going to have uh, an impact on geopolitics. Yeah, I'm not, I have to admit, um, my issues with the Economist pile up. <laughs> I don't know his work, so I can't uh, comment on it. Sorry. That's okay. But none. Okay. Sorry. So um, the next question is going to, uh, to go to Dr. Sam Tangredi. Okay. And then will we also hear from some of the students? Yes, uh, he'll be the final faculty member to comment, and then I'll go to the general student body. Okay. Sam? Thank you. Um, Dr. Jurgen, I uh, want to know your comments on the two energy industries that seem to have effectively died, and that's hydroelectric power and nuclear power. And it's interesting that um, some years ago, both were seen as great alternatives to the um, carbon energy, and yet to both, through a number of circumstances, have are no longer seen that way. Could you comment about kind of why that happened and if there's any well, lesson in that? Well, with hydropower, some will say there are not a lot of places left and uh, hyd large hydro projects are, you know, generate a lot of opposition. You, you had three gorges in China and so forth, but a lot of environmental opposition. And I think people who might fund it, like the World Bank, I believe have really backed away from from uh, hydro, so uh, you just can't, I mean, some places you can do it, but, but not in any large scale. Nuclear, uh, you're quite right. I, was, um, I mean, it's been done in by cost, really. There, there are new power plants that are being built in uh, it Georgia, and they're just so over budget. Now in China, they build nuclear power plants pretty quickly and uh, they continue, you know, they're really stepping up their role of nuclear in their, uh, uh, in their energy supply. But in most of the advanced uh, industrial countries, just there are a few projects left. But um, the it, two things I'll say that one, uh, Bill Gates has a book coming out on climate and I'm gonna interview him in about two weeks about it. So I was reading Advanced Galley he makes a big, a big argument that you can't meet climate goals without nuclear. And I was surprised to find, as I was researching the new map, and this is the updated number now, there's 62 advanced nuclear 
companies and projects uh, in the United States. Uh, and the idea is, is about small nuclear, small modular reactors that would be built in a factory and then be installed and not have huge construction projects. So, uh, but they take time and, it, and it's complicated because they've got to go through licensing. Bill Gates has uh, his, uh, I think it's called Terra Power company that he's been putting money into. So um, there's a commitment and, and as Bill points out in the book, solar and wind take up a lot of land, a lot of territory. Uh, small modular nuclear reactors would not. So uh, I would say that it's got to really to really have an impact. It has to go to a next generation of nuclear power, no longer Admiral Rickover's uh, nuclear submarines as the, as the origin, which was in the, in the, in the quest, I had, it, was, it was very interesting to just write about how uh, uh, Admiral Rickover was both uh, head of the Navy's nuclear program and head of the Atomic Energy uh, commission at the same time, so he would write memos to himself and then approve it and send it back to himself and it got things done. He can't do things like that anymore. 